All right, hey everyone. So it's that time again. We're going over the reteaching guide. My hope is that you will use this video uh, to either check the work that to both check the work that you have already done. Hopefully, you have this mostly complete by now, and to also fill in any gaps that you might have. All right. So let's start here at the top. What was the Bourbon Triumvirate? The Bourbon Triumvirate was a group of political leaders that ran Georgia from 1870 to 1890. Their last names were Brown, Colquitt, and Gordon, and they revolved in and out of positions of significant political power in Georgia. And they used their time in those positions to promote industrial growth in Georgia, as well as basically enrich themselves. Now, so positive impacts. Well, we do see industrial growth uh, in Georgia under the Bourbons. We also see the economy begin to recover from the Civil War finally. Negative impacts, though. They were white supremacists. All right, we can go take a look at the notes here so we can get a really precise answer. So positive, they encouraged business and industry. They grew the textile industry, rebuilt Georgia's economy. But on the negative side, they were white supremacists, supported the convict lease system, and in general, they didn't really care about poor people or improving the lives of poor people. Okay. Um, so we could say that the focus of the Bourbons was on industrial and economic growth in Georgia. Um, the Bourbons, what political party they were they members of? All right, let's move on. So next up, it says, who was the father, quote unquote, of the New South? Who came up with this concept called the New South? And as you might imagine, the best place to turn for that answer is the notes. And obviously, that's going to be um, Henry Grady here. Okay, so we can go back in there. And you can just type Henry Grady there. So what was his vision of the New South? Um, it was a vision of northern investment creating southern industrial growth um, with diversified farming, but also maintaining the social order of the South, uh, mainly white supremacy. All right. Uh, how did he use the cotton expositions to fuel this movement? So basically, the cotton expositions were, let's see, a series of three expositions were fairs, head in Atlanta to demonstrate the industries of the New South. So basically, they showed the world what was possible in Atlanta, okay? All right, we talked briefly about the convict lease system. Uh, again, this was something that I told you you needed to take independent notes on, so let me briefly go over it. The convict lease system was a system whereby the state leased out the labor of convicts to private industry, mines, um, and plantations primarily. Why was it viewed as an unjust system? Well, it looked a whole lot like slavery. In fact, modern historians call it slavery by another name. Uh, and that is because these types of laws and this system had a disproportionate impact on African Americans in Georgia. All right. Okay, next up, who was the Tom Watson? So let's go take a look. At our notes here, da, 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 there he is. Uh, so Tom Watson was a uh, pol politician and a leader of the populist party. So that's that's really who he was, at least for the purposes of this class. Okay. Uh, what were the goals of the populist party? Uh, you can kind of see that right here. They promoted the interest of farmers and, in general, people who lived in rural communities. All right. Uh, what was the rule free delivery bill? This was the bill that made the post office deliver mail to rural residents, to people who leave, lived in the countryside, and that kind of opened up their world for them. This one says explain the impact of the rule free delivery bill and who is responsible for seeing it pass into law. I mean, it's kind of redundant, but the impact of the rule free delivery bill is that people who lived in the country began, became connected to the outside world in a significant way. And again, the person responsible is, of course, Tom Watson. All right, let's describe the three causes of the 1906 Atlanta race riots. 
So if we go into here under the notes that say causes of the Atlanta race riot, you can see that there's three main bullet points here. Those are going to be the three causes. So cause number one of the race riot is population growth in Atlanta. Mostly farmers moving to the jobs, push pressure on city services, increased job competition. But you can just summarize it by saying population growth in Atlanta. Reason number two, white resentment of a, an emerging black elite in Atlanta. All right. Reason number three um, is the sensationalist news stories that were printed in Atlanta papers um, accusing black men of attacking white women. Okay. All right, let's describe the three impacts. So we go through the events here, but down here we can talk about the impacts. And there's actually more than three, so I'm just going to go through a bunch of different ones. Um, the first impact was short-lived and kind of went away pretty quickly, and that was the formation of a biracial community, committee to try to heal the division. So there was some effort to do that, but it quickly fizzled out. Um, and so as a result, we see long term, even deeper divisions between black and white communities, we see more segregation, and we see a restriction on black voting rights. So if you really wanted to get the three big takeaways, we see deeper divisions between black the black community and white community in Atlanta. We see more segregation, more Jim Crow. And then we also see a we see further restrictions on the voting rights of African Americans. Okay. All right. Describe Plessy versus Ferguson and its impact. So best thing to do would be to go to our notes here for Plessy versus Ferguson. And as far as what it was, it was a U.S. Supreme Court law or Supreme Court case that declared Jim Crow laws legal or constitutional. Um, you can also mention something about the nature of the case where Homer Plessy was charged with the crime of riding in a whites-only train car. Um, that's going to be important for your test. So put that together into a, a one complete sentence and you'll be fine. Uh, describe Jim Crow laws. So uh, the best description I can give you here is these are a set of laws passed that mandate racial segregation and give white supremacy the force of law. All right. Define disenfranchisement. We've defined this quite a lot, so I hope you know this by now, but it means to deny somebody their right to vote. Okay. Um, describe the following methods of disenfranchisement. So let's go back to our notes here, right there. So we've got poll tax. So let's go take a look at what the poll tax is. Charge money in order to be able to vote. Property requirements. Right here, required to own a certain amount of property in order to vote. Literacy tests, um, required African Americans to pass a test in order to register to vote. Okay, And then last but not least, the grandfather clause. And you can just use this definition here. Um, and it basically said only those men whose fathers or grandfathers have been eligible to vote in 1867 would be eligible to vote from 1908 onward. Okay, uh, Why was racial violence used? to discourage African Americans from voting? I mean, I think the answer is actually in the question. Um, violence was used as a means of denying African Americans their piece of America's power, political power, um, their piece of, they're to deny them full class citizenship in the United States. Um, all right, uh, compare and contrast Booker T and W.B. Du Bois. So let's get into that. The best thing to do to help you with this section is actually open up one of the activities that we did. The New South Leaders Graphic Organizer, I believe that was from Monday the 11th, but I'll go ahead and display it here. Where we go over their different steps towards achieving civil rights in the United States. Okay. So it says Booker T. Washington's four steps to achieving civil rights. We got them right here. Step one was education with the Tuskegee Institute. Step two, uh, trade. Uh, we could say trade education. Step two is economic independence. Step three, social and political equality. And step four is going to be racial equality. So over here for Du Bois, his four steps are both similar and, and different than Washington's. Both start in education. Du Bois' idea for education is called the Talented Tenth. 
Um, both have, or sorry, this is where they start getting different is in the middle. Du Bois says that social and political equality are the next steps, is the next step. Uh, and only after that is achieved can true economic independence be reached. Uh, but then ultimately, the ultimate goal is racial equality under the law. Okay. Uh, how are their viewpoints alike? They both have the same start point and end point. They both start with education, end with racial equity. Um, how are their viewpoints different? It's the middle steps. Um, Washington thinks economic independence comes first, where Du Bois thinks political equality comes first. Right. How did Alonzo Herndon become one of the richest black men in, uh, in America around the turn of the 20th century? Uh, so let's go take a look at his slide. All right, here we go. Uh, Herndon, let's see, 1858 to 1927. Um, so the question here is, how did Alonzo Herndon uh, become one of the richest black men in America? And it's right here. He became a millionaire because by building up the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Okay. How did Herndon use his money and importance to positively impact the black community? So I didn't really put that in the slide, but we did talk about it. Herndon would use, and it's in the reading, Herndon would use his riches to both pursue philanthropic causes, um, philanthropy related to civil rights, the civil rights movement, as well as investing in starting, helping African Americans start businesses uh, and by investing in them early. Okay. All right, next up, anti-Semitism. So let's pull up those Leo Frank notes. All right, so let's take a look at those notes. Let's see. First here says, uh, who was Leo Frank? So down here we have the definition of anti-Semitism, basically hostility to or prejudice against Jewish people. What was Leo Frank's original sentence? So we got to skip to the trial here. Um, Frank was found guilty and sentenced to death by the jury. Okay. Uh, who changed Frank's sentence and what was it changed to? So this is where we talk about the fact that the governor would commute Frank's sentence from death to life in prison. All right. Um, what eventually happened to Frank and what was its three long-term impacts on Georgia? So Frank was, you need to describe where Frank was broken out of jail, driven back to Marietta and lynched by a group calling themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan. Three impacts are right here. This reflected poorly on Georgia, show that Georgians resented outsiders. We see a decline in Jewish communities, particularly Jewish businesses, after this incident. And we finally see, or we finally, we see the return of the KKK to Georgia, a return that has not stopped. They're still here. All right, that about does it. Uh, once you get done, I would like for you to use the remaining time to do you do the two quizlets uh, the vocab one and the new south one as well as get your aks cards done for unit seven uh, make sure that you're caught up there um, yeah other than that hope to see you guys tomorrow bye